Okay, so welcome to the Food History Seminar. Um, today we have two presentations, um, one from Sylvia Pizzarani and one from Norman Rusin. Um, I, I'm sorry, I possibly dis destroyed your surnames there, but I hope not. Um, but they're both going to be talking um, about, um, um, well, uh, sorry, I'll start that again. Um, Sylvia will be talking about um, the energy crisis and austerity, while um, Norman will be talking about um, women and food in Christ. Um, at, uh, I'm I'm completely losing my mind today. I will begin this. I will begin with just talk, introducing one speaker at a time. We'll go from there. So um, I'll start with Sylvia, who's going to be our first presentation. Um, she's a PhD student at the University of Bologna, and will be talking to us about eating rationally educate the consumer to face austerity and the energy crisis. So if I can hand over to you, Sylvia, and then we'll move to Norman after a quick Q&A. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. I will share uh, my presentation. OK. Sorry. OK. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Thank you uh, for the, to the organizers for uh, this opportunity. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I'm really pumped, I have to say, to share this part of my research with you. Um, uh, I'm a, a PhD uh, student at the University of Bologna and the, the goal of my research is to uh, explore the, the relationship between consumption and politics in the 70s in Italy. Um, uh, the, the, 70s, the 70s marked an important change you know, from a political, cultural, and consumeristic uh, point of view. For my research, I'm, I'm using uh, different kinds of sources, uh, magazine, women, uh, female magazines, news and entertainment magazines, um, archival sources, uh, mainly uh, business archives of Eni and Fiat, and uh, advertising and advertisement-related material. Uh, I, I try to um, you know, cross-reference these, uh, these sources and get them to, to communicate because consumption, uh, dealing with consumption and politics means to you know, uh, look um, to, uh, you know, uh, um, to uh, you know, uh, study politics and economy, but also cult culture and, and society. So a lot of, uh, a lot of layers. Um, so um, in the output, my research started analyzing the oil crisis of 1973. Um, in this period, the Italy, while facing the rise of crude oil prices, um, the, the government had to deal with uh, the decrease in oil supplies and uh, the increase in the cost of raw materials and, of course, uh, consumer prices. Um, consumer prices increased of 25%. Uh, during 1973, and uh, Italy had to deal with the so-called acts of austerity, which was um, seen as uh, necessary in order to uh, reduce unnecessary expenses. This is a um, picture of uh, dancers from a nightclub in Cesena uh, protesting against austerity measures. And for example, they, they were screaming like, we will undress in the public square, we let us work by candlelight because uh, uh, rumors government uh, promoted uh, these austerity measures, such as the ban on uh, on driving on car cars on Sundays, uh, the the end of uh, the early end of television programs, the reduction of street and commercial lighting, lighting, um, the um, the restriction of car traffic uh, during the the week based on alternate li license plates, and so on and. During this uh, debate um, about austerity, um, it of course uh, uh, from the sources it uh, emerged in uh, in different ways, but uh, there was this common element, uh, this common uh, worry about worries about uh, word the word riding red. You know the, the the idea that the myths of the abundance of black gold, the inevitable expansion of affluence, these these ideas, these myths were dramatically challenged. And, and this was quite common in every sources that I, I analyzed. And, um, and in, uh, in this uh, context, uh, from, the second, from the end of the Second World War, basically the word rationing appeared again you know, on the news. And uh, 
someone talked about the end of consumerism, the death of the car, uh, while describing the years of the economic boom, the previous decades of the economic, Italian economic boom as a period of madness, of recklessness, which had to be cured with the austerity and, uh, and uh, uh, rationality. Um, in this context, uh, um, it was, uh, there was a strong discussion about public planning. Um, public planning emerged with trend, especially after the Second World War. It was conceived as a rational moment of political enlightenment, uh, whose task was to uh, tame the anarchic spontaneity of the market. And uh, in this one of the support, the supporter of public planning was the, the jurist Stefano Rodotà, who believed that uh, um, individual idea that individual consumers alone had the power to uh, control the market and control uh, goods quality and prices. It was it was a myth basically, and um, consumers needed uh, the support of the state and uh, more investment uh, in the in so, you know public services and. Uh, so they needed stronger in institution. But in this, uh, this, this uh, narrative about public planning, there was also a lot of, uh, there was a, a strong paternalistic view. Um, for example, some econo economists in those uh, years affirmed that the country is living beyond its means. Like a badly managed family, they spend a lot of money producing little and make do with that. And as in a badly managed uh, family, according to uh, a minister of the Rumors government, the minister Giolitti, it was therefore necessary to have a father who must know how to be severe. Um, we will explain to workers that it is necessary to consume less in order to save and, uh, and invest. Also, for example, uh, this paternalistic view was quite common. The, uh, yes, among uh, the Christian Democratic Party, the Communist Party, the, the political class generally. Um, and uh, so the, there was the need to moralize uh, citizens, especially in their role as consumers. The idea that they needed to be guided in order to make right, uh, right choices. And during the economic boom, women became their consumers Excellent. There are a lot of interesting works uh, by, by Emanuela Scarpellini and Enrique Asker about this. And um, uh, so the relationship between gender and consumption became really, really uh, strong during the economic boom. And it changed significantly during, during the 70s, because while in the 60s, the, 60s, the consumer virtually coincided with the housewife, uh, during the 70s, there were new uh, dynamics. Uh, women started to work uh, more outside uh, um, the, um, the house uh, and they had access to more um, possibilities, uh, not only in the work field, but also uh, if we think about leisure activities and they had new possibilities also for political activities and, and so on. So after the outbreak of the crisis, women were uh, more and more often depicted as spendthrift consumers who needed them to be educated to, to go back to a more rational uh, way of shopping. There was the idea that uh, women should have been, um, they, they should have um, redirected um, their, their propensity for shopping towards a more rational consumption. And so, um, uh, in, in the, so that they could also become moral guide if they uh, were able to go back to how they managed the family before the economic boom, they could be, you know, they could become moral guide for uh, for the country. So there was, uh, it was believed that women had a sort of natural inclination for shopping and uh, but instead of, uh, they, but they started to use this natural inclination, you know, for sales seasons and for, um, uh, uh, yes, for luxury, luxury goods, luxury shopping. So they have, they were asked to relearn how to manage scarcity, uh, especially in the in the domestic world. And this is an article. It was an article appeared on a German newspaper, which was translated by Gente, one of the. Uh, magazines I, I'm studying, and uh, the article was about an entrepreneur called Housewife, and and it was dedicated this article to 
a little known and little appreciated profession, and yet one of the most interesting of our time. So the idea was that um, since the, the housewife was, was a manager, basically, because the housewife, the housewife was handling uh, you know, the salaries of the own and, and, and every kind of shopping. And the entrepreneur called housewife does not lack satisfaction, even higher than those obtained in the most sought after male professions. The management of the house, moreover, is a largely independent activity and therefore gives the woman more freedom than she could find in a subordinate employment relationship. Um, sorry, uh, the prejudices against the housewife of which women themselves are victims have no reason to exist. So they were trying to reevaluate, there was a sort of reevaluation of the skills of women as housewives and uh, as uh, managers of, uh, of the home. And food was really important in this context because uh, together with uh, oil, uh, red meat was uh, uh, one of the most uh, um, expensive uh, goods on the Italian market because it was mainly important. And uh, there was, um, after, during the economic boom, it was really important. It was really, there's a really great symbolic value for Italian people to have access to red meat and to particularly, particularly good cuts of red meat, uh, resemble steaks because it was a symbol of affluence, of wealth, of the new affluence they were able to access after the, after the, the war and the scarcity period. So there was, um, it was, became really common for Italian families to invest a lot in red meat, in, in steaks. And um, so it was important uh, for, uh, for the government to redirect people into buying other kinds of meat. Um, as we can, okay, it's, it's after, sorry. Um, there is a, a commercial about it later. Um, and uh, um, for example, meat, meat alone in an article was stated, uh, takes 11.3% of the income of an average Italian family and had become a huge expense in household budgets. And, the, and then the, so there were various campaigns that tried to raise awareness, redirect women's taste towards cheaper types of meat, not only other kind of animals, but there were a lot of recipe uh, concerning, you know, how to use uh, different cuts, cheaper cuts, more, uh, you know, uh, poorer kind of uh, cuts of the meat. And um, um, there were also, um, the women, uh, women were distracted by the wealth of the economic uh, boom, basically. So they needed an help in this situation. And the columns, you know, columns in magazine uh, started to uh, uh, became more and more important in this context. For example, column about how to save, how to eat, uh, columns about uh, new kind of food, the pre-cooked food, for example, the future in the kitchen. And um, um, in, in women, especially in female magazines, uh, these, uh, they were the first using uh, these kind of columns uh, for uh, you know, advice and started to expand a lot during this decade. And they became real uh, consultancy services uh, and included the most disparate topics. And of course, the more important were how to eat, dietary uh, um, columns, uh, but also beauty, psychological columns. And uh, even they also, there were also columns given uh, legal advice, for example. Um, and so they were trying to help basically women uh, in order to shop in a rational way, in a more uh, useful way for uh, the economic situation uh, in general. Um, there were also a lot of uh, surveys and quiz, quizzes, uh, which became very popular among female readers, um, especially on, on Cosmopolitan, which is one of the magazine and, magazines I'm studying, uh, of course, the, the Italian Cosmopolitan. They basically selected a range of uh, daily behaviors, attitudes, and they standardized these, uh, these behaviors in order to uh, give them uh, um, uh, you know, points and give them a score and uh, a respective uh, result. Um, in this example, you can see, is your diet right or wrong? You are what you eat. Uh, if you want to know the meaning of some of your reactions, answer to these 22 questions accurately. 
So there was also, you know, um, they, they, they judge, they, they started to also give a score to certain kind of uh, behaviors and, uh, and lifestyle, uh, basically. Um, this is one of the commercial I was, um, this is a state actually, a state advertising um, from the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Forest about uh, uh, other kind of meat. Uh, women could buy uh, cheaper meat, for example, in this case, a chicken. If you want to eat better today, eat with me. With the chicken, you eat well and, uh, and safe. Um, so the state, um, so in itself as an expert, uh, which was able, who was able to help the housewife, but also uh, there were like grocery shop and supermarket who started to, um, uh, to uh, show themselves as uh, a support figure for the housewife, for, for women shopping. And this is uh, an, advertisement, an advertisement from the spa saying buying groceries is not a game anymore. In the spa, there is an expert who can help you saving. The spa, a new social function, a uh, commitment. And this is another uh, example, uh, a commercial from Parmigiano Reggiano saying you need to eat rationally in order to have an healthy life. In every bite of Parmigiano Reggiano, there is everything you need, proteins, vitamins, minerals, salts, and so on. So as you can see, different kind of uh, actors uh, started to portray themselves as, uh, uh, as experts, as um, educators, and, and also as an, an helping hands for the housewife in trying to understand how to buy, how to spend their money, and then how to cook uh, what, she, what she is buying. Um, there were also a lot of uh, um, advertorials, uh, a commercial which was uh, disguised as a journalistic services. And um, together with these expert columns uh, and these kind of uh, commercial, they played a fundamental role in changing um, gender roles in the consumption sphere. The consumers became more and more uh, homo economicus, became more and more um, basically um, uh, consumption is it uh, became more a business of a simple business of buying, which was a, which could be you know learned, which could be um, uh, explained, and uh, consumer uh, individually were able to learn and to understand how to spend their money and to, uh, to buy in a rational way with the help of technicians and uh, technicians' experiences. I think that um, in this context, an, an, an interesting moment was uh, uh, when during the election in 1979 in, in, in Britain, when Margaret Thatcher was, was elected. Um, because this is uh, an article from the magazine Oggi uh, in, in this article, they were uh, uh, they were uh, describing Margaret Thatcher's campaign and uh, her, her figure, and uh, they said that uh, the British liked her for the pragmatism with which she faces everyday problems. Throughout the electoral campaign, she has emphasized her bourgeois origins, um, the grocery shop of her father, and uh, um, in every speeches and press conferences. She did not miss the opportunity to remember everyone her familiarity with sales prices. In addition to her shopkeeper origins, her skills come from her being a woman. Hence, she frequents shops. I know what it means to shop and see that prices increase from week to week. So there was a, a, this overlap between you know, uh, uh, the, the rational uh, housewife which was also used on a political on this kind of political moment, and it was understood by in, in Italy. It was uh, this kind of uh, of uh, narrative was understood by, by magazines and uh, and by people. But there was also um, a sort. It was not completely accepted uh, by women. This, this kind of narrative, um, in seeing the, especially these uh, female magazines, there was a sort of creative response to, creative answer to the austerity measures and to austerity narrative. The, um, there was a sort of uh, different kind of resistance because um, for women, uh, the access to the consumption sphere did also not, 
was did not only man, mean that they were able to access to new kind of goods and uh, but it also and and uh, and leisure activities but it also meant that they were able to access to new uh, possibilities uh, and uh, in, in life to new places in, in places in which they could uh, meet to exchange ideas and to spend their time in a in a different way these are some uh, examples. These are articles from Grazia and Amica to other female magazines. And uh, in the first, the first one is austere but beautiful. Is uh, basically an article about yes, okay, we have to save money because there is austerity, but this do not mean that we have to give up taking care of us. We don't have to give up to what we achieved in the last decades. Um, the other article uh, stated with without car, it's not a problem. We can still wear fancy dresses and take the tram. If we don't, we, we can't drive uh, cars during Sunday, it's not a problem. We can put on a fancy dress and ride a, ride a bike. And, uh, and so if we have to spend a Sunday at home, we can take, we can take care of ourselves. So uh, there was a sort of uh, resistance uh, about, against this, uh, this narrative. And there were, of course, more political resistance. For example, there was uh, um, some articles on the Amica stated that uh, these, uh, these uh, shopping uh, crises uh, and uh, economic crisis, of course, was um, it invested uh, above all the poor housewives. And um, it was really not the main problems, but it was a political issue. It was not stated that it was not seen as something, as something natural. And of course, uh, the feminist magazine F was, uh, of course, very political and was, um, they recognized uh, that there was a class dimension of the austerity and uh, in their opinion, rich people, luxury consumption were not really affected by austerity measures. And uh, the increases in price, the increase in prices uh, would not only brought the, the reduction of salaries and so on, but it also meant, meant for women, the intensification of domestic work. Especially if we think about food and uh, and uh, and cooking, it would have taken more work hours to, and I quote, turn the increasingly poorer ingredients into tasty and nutritious meals. So um, there was a gender dimension. There was also class dimension in the austerity, and uh, working class women were of course more affected by by this uh, situation, and. Uh, uh, according to F, uh, during the, the economic boom, women would, um, were, uh, were basically, the, the state asked women to consume uh, and consume and consume and consume, and then uh, they were, the state was accusing women of uh, squandering the nation's, uh, uh, and as well as the family's uh, fortune and the family income. So, uh, I'm sorry, um, food consumption was, uh, was a political matter. And uh, at the end of this, uh, of this decade, uh, this, um, this clash between the political and the consumption sphere, uh, of course, had a particular, uh, had different uh, results. One of these is the affirmation of a new consumer culture. Modern consumers, especially women, but not only, women became subjects able to do the best possible choices for themselves and society through more education and the help of experts. So information and education was seen as a neutral, became a neutral field of action where the concept of rationality apparently did not have any political aspects. And uh, if we think about uh, nutrition, it was, this became, experts became really important for nutrition, uh, the nutrition sphere because uh, in fact, if, if, especially if we think about the 80s, there was uh, this diet fashion which uh, took hold and um, the rise of uh, not the attention of diet, dietary in Italy, there was the boom of the Mediterranean diet. Uh, and of course, you needed experts, you needed you know, technicians which could help you decide uh, which diet was best for you and so on. And there was also during the 80s, the rise of attention to food labeling and to organic food. And this attention started in the 70s. And uh, 
it was really uh, linked to the concept of, uh, of education. Um, to, to conclude that there was a, a sort of a new reason, new rationality, which preva prevailed on the economic and political level, but also in the consumption sphere. The closure of alternatives was entirely ascribed to a discourse of rational choices guided by technical uh, knowledge of experts and advertisers and by economic convenience seen as something completely neutral. Um, there was a strengthening, a strengthening of institutionalization of the figure of the consumer, both on a national and a European level. For example, the BEUC, the Bureau Europe and the Union de Consumatore, was founded in the early 70s. And one of its aim was to inform and making consumers be able more and more rational, as it was stated in one of the BEUC document. And in fact, in, uh, in 1976, 1976 uh, the Bureau promoted a study on consumer education in schools aimed at formulating an action strategy in order to improve and promote consumer education. And uh, uh, it stated the education given by the school systems of the nine member state as the aim of helping in the general and professional education of its citizens. In the course of the last 10 years, it has become more and more clear that the education of citizens must, with regard to their role as consumers in Western society, is insufficient. The school can and must contribute to this, to this education for uh, consumers. So uh, such a civic education, consumer education, became an integral part of the concept of citizenship. And this uh, uh, neutrality uh, basically uh, emptied you know, consumption of those challenging and in part subversive elements that emerged over, over the 70s. And uh, food was... Uh, was a really important part of uh, of this uh, of this change, and so I conclude with this. And thank you for your attention. Brilliant! Thank you very much. Um, we've got time for a few questions before we move on to. So if anyone would like to put a question into the chat or raise your hands and virtually on them with the, using the um, reactions options, then please feel free to do so. Um, I'll try to keep an eye out for the vir virtual ones, but I, you go over several pages, so I'll try my best on that. Um, first of all, um, Sylvia, I've got just a very small question. on Why was there a lack of local production of um, red meat? Was was there a particular reason why that kind of um, agriculture kind of collapsed or reduced at that time compared, compared to others? Okay, I answer immediately. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was less, um, it was less uh, common. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on, uh, on, on this, I have to say, I have to be honest, but as far as I understood, it was because uh, um, there were more, um, more typical local production uh, concerning, for example, pigs and chickens and rabbits, which were, you know, uh, which were sm smaller, um, you needed smaller territories in order to uh, breed these kind of animals. And uh, they were poorer, I, I mean, yes, uh, animals for you know uh, yeah poorer poorer kind cheaper kinds of of animals which were more common in Italy back then so I think that 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 was uh, I mean um, that was the main reason uh, so it always been the kind of case that they were importing more than producing locally anyway so it, was, it wasn't such change it was just a continuity of yeah, that. Yeah. basically uh, people people taste people interest in red meat uh, a change uh, uh, quicker than uh, you know the Italian economy at, economy at the time to to adjust to this uh, to this demand. Basically, I think. Thank you, thank you. That's that's thank really you. useful to know. <laughs> uh, Norman, I think your hand up was first. Yes, yes. Well, uh, Silvia, thank you for this presentation. It's very very informative. I enjoyed it very much. I I just have one very quick question slash comment in one of your slides from the political magazine F, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there was something that, that caught my eye, the, the equation between austerity and autarky. And I was wondering if you could comment on that, how, 
how uh, these journalists or political commentators uh, connected austerity and autarky because there was I, I I can see the connection but I was wondering if you, if you can comment on their uh, line of thought especially given that we are talking about the 70s you know the famous Anni di Piombo and all that you know yeah, there was uh, also on the espresso. Uh, there was it was used this sort of equation. It was used um, in order to make a sort of crit political critique of uh, austerity policy. So espresso and F basically linked uh, uh, linked uh, austerity measures to autarky in order to say that these those measures was basically. Uh, uh, they were used, they, they were basically fascist, not that they were fascist uh, policies, but that they were uh, basically hitting the population as uh, there was a sort of, uh, they, they recall a bit uh, these, uh, th those, those, uh, those kind of measures because they were hitting people and uh, without a real concern of, for, you know, for workers and for their, um, but it was more, a sort of uh, uh, political tool in order to critique this kind of uh, uh, provocation. So F um, stated that uh, uh, if uh, for, ex for a slip of the tongue, they will say autarky instead of austerity, it will be clear who we are dealing with. So the, the point of F was basically this uh, political class, they, they, are, uh, they are fascist and, and they will uh, they will uh, reveal themselves at a certain point. So it was a really strong critique. Mm -hmm. But you can Thank find you. the articles uh, online if you want to read it. Uh, I, oh. It's everything, of course, in Italian, but it's everything open source and you can read the entire article. I can put the, the link in the chat if you want. Oh, that, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. I'm going to ask one of the questions from the chat and then I'll move to Kelly um, next. So um, Marco has asked, um, do you think that politics is coming back now to address food consumption issues? Oh, that's, that's a challenging question. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think that uh, basically politic food and it, it, it is always a political issues, you know, and food consumption, uh, so I think that politics never has never stopped to <laughs> to address food uh, consumption, and I think that, for example, I, I'm not an expert. Of course, I can give you my my personal opinion, but um, I think that, uh, especially in, the, for example, from the Italian point of view, there is a a, a lot of uh, interest uh, which uh, arise. Uh, you know, during during the last decades, around food as um, a national product, as you know, you know, it was used to strengthen Italian identity, but it, it also became an important economic. Uh, it, it's an economic, you know, food itself. It's it's an economic good which is exported, and it's a brand now. So, from the Italian point of view, I think this this aspect. Is still really really important, and it also changed a lot how we Italians uh, uh, our relationship with food is is really is heavily influenced by that. And I think also with with the COVID situation, uh, it is also I mean with COVID in general, we heard a lot about uh, what is uh, seen as a necessary activity, unnecessary activity, unnecessary goods, unnecessary goods. And this also was uh, was really, I think this also was really, uh, yeah, hitting uh, also the, the food sphere, nutrition sphere. I don't know if I answer, but it's a, it's a really difficult question. <laughs> Marco says thanks in the chat, so <laughs> I, I think so. Thank you. Uh, Kelly. Uh, so thanks, man. Um, thank you, uh, Sylvia. That was really fascinating. Um, um, ideas about sort of house were free and sort of training and things like that. Um, I was curious, I know you said that, you know, the government is asking for austerity, which um, meant that there was more intensification of domestic work for women. And I'm thinking about that dynamic about, 
you know, more women going out to work at this time. And I'm thinking of, I, I don't know necessarily Italian history, but in American and British history, you have sort of the feminist movement and the move away from domesticity. So I wonder if there's some kind of tension in Italy at this time between those kind of two spheres. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I uh, forgot to mention, but this was a kind of quite important thing to say. Of course, the 70s were really important for the feminist movement. Uh, it's a really important time for the feminist movement in, uh, in Italy. And um, there was an important movement concerning domestic work and concerning the fact that domestic work was a work and it has to have the right recognition. And so um, also FA, FA articles uh, was, uh, was inside this, uh, this narrative, this, uh, this discourse about the fact that uh, the, the, the activities that women had to do uh, in, inside the, the home was, uh, was another kind, was a job itself. And so, uh, of course, if we are going to uh, to give to women more more stuff to do at home, they will not be able to work out to to create a life outside of the home. They will not be able to uh, to take to take care of their political uh, issues and uh, political battles and and so on. So yeah, that definitely was uh, was a problem. And uh, in fact, one of the answer were was uh, from you know uh, enterprises was. Uh, the the selling of pre cooked food uh, or uh, but there was still in the seventies a lot of uh, uh, mistrust towards pre cooked food uh, uh, and in, in Italy it was still uh, th there was a lot of interest but it was still a, a bit of uh, mistrust so they were not seen a lot as a, a real help for housewives. Thank you. Thank you. We can just have one more question and then we will probably need to move on. So I'm just going to deal with um, Peter's one in the chat. Um, did you look at women's magazines from earlier periods to see if much of what was covered was similar or different? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you also for this question. Uh, I um, There are a lot of um, works of other historians about the 60s and something about the 80s. They were more covered, uh, and so I, I was able to look into other histori uh, historians' uh, works. Uh, and uh, yes, there was definitely um, a change, uh, uh, especially uh, concerning how women were depicted as consumers. Um, in, the, in the 60s, there were still uh, women depicted inside the home as housewives, uh, and going especially through the, the end of the 60s, women started to be depicted more and more often outside, uh, the, outside the home, uh, doing stuff which could, could be family related, but uh, uh, outside the home, like you know, activities outside, uh, uh, women on vacation and the women at work. And, in, and, uh, and it's interesting if we look at you know, the ad advertising sector, this is really, really strong. This difference is really, really strong. This, uh, yes, this difference between the end, you know, the, 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 the period before 1968, especially, which is not, which is a, not, a, 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 which is a particular year. I did not choose it by, by chance, of course, uh, but there was a difference, especially in the advertising sector on how women were, were uh, in advertisements on how women were depicted and, um, and, uh, and in the article, I, I, I have to say, I have to, I didn't have the occasion to uh, read, to read a lot of articles. I, I looked more into, uh, into advertising concerning 60s and, and the 80s for a matter of time, uh, unfortunately. But uh, I, I can see for what I read from other researchers, uh, works and so on, there is a... Um, there is also a lot of uh, difference on uh, how um, consumers in general were, were depicted because in the 50s and 60s, of course, uh, uh, the, the relationship between politics and consumption was completely different. It was a, an economic, different economic situation. And uh, sorry, I, I, I'm afraid I lost the point, but I hope I, I answer. But, 
Brilliant. Thank you. Um, that's all we've got time for and we need to move on to Norman, but there are a couple of more questions in the chat that you may want to just have a quick look at. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'll just do my virtual clap, but thank you. Um, thank you for all the yeah. questions and so on. No, thank you. Um, now, now we're moving on to Norman. Um, so Norman is a lecturer at the University of Rose Island, and today he's going to be talking about Wild Witch and Wench, Women and Food in Christ, stopped at Ebola and the prison. I believe that's right. Um, yes. So I'll pass over to you, Norman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me today. I'm very excited about this uh, meeting. Um, so uh, without... Much further ado, let me try to share my PowerPoint presentation. And uh, so I can move on to the presentation itself. Can you, can you see it? Yes, I um, just need to move to presentation mode. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So, um, Today I'm going to be talking about uh, the role of uh, the relationship between women and food in two very important novels of uh, what we call uh, Italian resistance literature. Uh, one is Christ Stopped at Eboli by Carlo Levi, and the other one is Cesare Pavese, The Jail, both published after the war, but both conceived uh, before the war, uh, especially, uh, particularly in the period of their isolation. Um, so between 1926 and 1943, the fascist regime confined more than uh, 6,300 people, making them live in remote villages far away from families and friends by extending an 1863 law, which allowed them to distance alleged criminals from their networks without due process. The dictatorship confined those suspected of political opposition, espionage, or homosexuality. Among them were many Italian intellectuals and artists, including Carlo Levi and Cesare Pavese, who between 1935 and 1936 were sent to Aliano in Basilicata and Brancaleone Calabro in Calabria, respectively. Both collected memories and impressions of those experiences in their autobiographical novels, uh, Christ of the Deboli, published in 1945, and The Prison, published in 1948. Characterized by differing styles, developments, ideation, and publication times, these two works have seldom, if ever, been compared to one another. Um, in the scholarship about Italian resistance literature, that actually they have a lot in common. In fact, a close look at them next to each other reveals how their authors comment on the relationship between bourgeois morality and politics especially with regard to women's roles within the micro societies in which they were confined. And that's what I will be talking about today. Levi and Pavese portray women as wild creatures, witches or wences, and their relationship to food problematizes the relationship between the male gaze and bourgeois morality and politics. Specifically, the way in which both authors describe women collecting, processing, preparing, serving, and consuming foods constitutes a series of silent tactics of resistance to gender hierarchies, and more in general, to fascist patriarchal policy. policies. Levi's story uh, begins with the author's narrator's arrival in Galliano, the fictional name Levi gives to his confinement town down in Basilicata. Little did the author know uh, that when he'd reached his destination, he'd find himself immersed in a micro world of witchcraft. Like all political prisoners, he was assigned a house and a maid. Dr. Milillo, the old retired town physician, quickly introduces himself as a town authority figure. Dr. Milillo immediately warns Levi about his new housekeeper and about women in general, who, according to him, are all witches. And here is a quote from Dr. Milillo. Don't take anything from a woman, neither wine nor coffee, nothing to eat or drink. They would be sure to put a filter or love potion in it. The women here will certainly take a fancy to you and all of them will make you such filters. Don't accept anything from the peasant women. The mayor knows I'm right. 
these potions are dangerous. They put it everywhere, in drinks, in chocolate, in sausages, perhaps even in their bread." End of quote. Dr. Milila's first speech shows three important points. First, not all women are witches, just the poor and the peasants, who seem to be the ones who end up serving in homes. Secondly, a male authority figure uses another male authority figure, the mayor, as their support, thus illustrating patriarchy's smear campaign of women to justify their elimination from the public sphere in life, as well as their subjugation of two men. Finally, he highlights witches' maliciousness in contaminating even the most sacred of foods, bread, a staple not only of the Mediterranean Christian tradition, but also of the fascist alimentary sovereign sovereignty politics, which I'm not going to address right now, but I'd be glad to discuss afterwards if you like, because I think it connects very well with the point Sylvia was making about the autarky uh, austerity thing. In other words, he shows how church, state, and ma medicine connect in their power struggle against women, a battle rooted in early modern Europe. Uh, as we can see. Uh, in addition to that, by conjuring up the power of the mayor, Dr. Milillo enhances his authority and reaffirms the status quo. During fascism, women's role were inside the household only. When Mussolini launched his demographic policies with his May 1927 speech, he reduced even the most autonomous women to three essential roles, wives, mothers, and sisters discouraging them to pursue any professions or careers, de facto excluding them from the job market. Drifting off the narrow, rigid path which the regime traces over Catholic petit bourgeois morality means not only facing dire consequences, such as isolation or confinement, but also siding with evil. When Dr. Milillo accuses women of witchcraft, therefore, he is replicating a centuries-old scheme which found its culmination and political embodiment in fascism. Accusations of witchcraft were given to women based on two reasons, their relationship with nature and their sexuality. The dichotomy featuring women as representations of irrationality and nature and men representing reason and civilization allows men to, to assume a superior position of power and to justify their submission of women. In the novels we're discussing today, female characters serve men, but not in a traditional role of wives. Instead, they're either their servants or their lovers or both, as we will see. Now I'm gonna talk about um, Julia, the witch maid. Levi introduces the witch maid who takes care of his chores as Julia Venere a 41-year-old woman who had, and I quote, 17 pregnancies brought about by 15 different men, end of quote. Her status as a witch mainly results from her stray sexual conduct. At the outset, not only does Levi's witch maid carry the quintessentially sensual name Venere, Venus, but she also seduces men with her, and I quote, solemn and barbaric beauty. According to the first-person narrator, she exudes quote, cold sensuality, hidden irony, natural cruelty, impenetrable ill humor, and an immense passive power, which climaxes on her black head of serpent, end of quote. In his study of the evolution of witches' iconology, Lorenzo Lorenzi states that Western tradition has always portrayed witches according to two types, the purely spiritual and the purely carnal which find their archetypes in the mythological figures of Lamia and Medusa. Therefore, Julia, Julia's wild features conjure up both Lamia's sensuality and Medusa's psychological power. Although Levi doesn't seem to question the witchy character of the woman, nor allows himself to be bewitched by her sensuality, he still respects her for her intellect and her ancestral traditions. Besides having her cook him two meals per day over several months, he, make, he makes her teach him all the spells and filters to heal or hurt, to bring good or bad luck, until he becomes, and I quote, a master of magic and its applications to medicine, end of quote. 
All the pages of this novel perspire with the antagonism between state and peasants, which becomes particularly clear during one episode. Another witch, La Parrocola, has a sick son and walks more than 20 kilometers to get to the closest pharmacist and buy medicines her son needs. The pharmacist asks her a price excessively higher than the regular one, only to take all of her money from her, thus using all his middle class power over the poor woman. In commenting this event, Levy states that, and I quote, these are the means used by the feudal petit bourgeois of these little villages, end of quote. And this sneaky manipulation and misuse of power makes the peasants hate the state and whomever represents it, including the scientific knowledge coming from these abusive doctors and pharmacists, and resorts to other kinds of knowledge and beliefs. Those that modern civilization labels as superstitions or witchcraft in an attempt to resist modernity's destructive power. Eventually, Levy, a former doctor himself, helps her out by earning her trust. In fact, by respecting these peasants' amulets and formulas, or as Levy states by, and I quote, paying tribute to their ancient origins and mysterious simplicity, end of quote, the author ingratiates these people, becomes their ally, and tries to fill that abyss between the state and the peasants, whether the state be fascist, liberal, socialist, or take on some new form in which the middle class bureaucracy still survives. And this was a quote by, from Levy, of course. In commenting on Levy's memoir, uh, historian Carlo Ginzburg noted that Levy shows a sympathia morale, a moral sympathy towards Galliano's peasants and their traditions, which reminded him of the Russian populists. However, as Giorgio Agamben puts it, in his comment to Levy's collection of essays, Fuga della Libertà, Escape from Freedom, this gap originates in the graft, and I quote, in the graft of a military, religious, juridical state idolizing civilization over a peasant, anarchic, non-religious, poetic civilization, end of quote. Therefore, Levy's representation of witches represent a form of resistance to modernity, to history, but it also works as a powerful reminder that there always is an alternative to a specific societal organization. I'm now moving on to Pavese's uh, novel and analyze the figure of Concha and Elena, two uh, powerful uh, female characters in that novel. Con uh, Cesare Pavese includes witches in his novel as well, although he wouldn't admit it, as we'll see. The jail displays much mistrust of patriarchal power and ostracism towards those who do not conform to its norms. However, the relationship between Stefano, the protagonist in Pavese's Alter Ego, and two women, Concha and Elena, reveal different tactics of resistance to this power. To Stefano, Concha subsumes the characteristics of the maid, the witch, and the savage. The first time Stefano sees her, he immediately characterizes her as a maid. And I quote, his fantasy burst out when one morning he saw a certain girl on the stairs. He'd seen her wandering the street, the only one, with quick and restrained steps, which looked almost like an impertinent dance, carrying on her hips, her dark, goat-like face with a self-confidence that looked like a smile. She was a maid because she was barefoot and sometimes carried water. Unlike Julia, who claims for herself the role of the witch, Concha's features highlight only imply her siding with evil. First of all, Stefano overcharges, overcharges her sexuality to represent her as a temptress. He portrays her always carrying an amphora, and I quote, placing it on her hips, resting on her ankles, end of quote. Not only does the amphora itself can be associated with the shape of a woman's body, but the representation of women carrying it has often been sexually charged. From Vincenzo Gemito's sculpture, Venere con Amphora, to Henri Matisse's 1952 painting, Woman with Amphora and Pomegranates, projecting strong sexual symbolisms. In addition, in addition to, this, to its sensuality, conscious Amphora brings uh, with it a nature-like wild taste. When he drinks water from the amphora, Stefano enjoys an earthy flavor, tart against, against it, his teeth, which it seemed to him the flavor of the amphora itself. 
it had inside something something goat like wild and really sweet at the same time which reminded him the color of geraniums and of quote while ingesting the only food concha ever offers him stefano only approximates the satisfaction of his desire and can only establish a metonymic relationship between the object of his desire and him while the amphora is the only thing Stefano can fully grasp in his hands, Concha swiftly dodges his intellectual and patriarchal grip with her quick and restrained steps. Moreover, time and time again, Stefano compares Concha's features to those of a goat. More than just symbolizing a closeness to nature, for, Pave for Pavese, these traits conjure up diabolical images. In Goat Back, one of the poems in Pavese's collections, Working Wears One Out, the poem links the goat to demonic sensuality. And I quote, the goat bites flowers, which fill her belly and needs to run away. When a man has had his pleasure with a woman, they have the hair even there. The baby fills her belly. So someone gets free and runs after the buck which squirts them and gets them drunk with a blood that is redder than fire. And then they all dance, standing up and howling to the moon." End of quote. In this scene, Pavese lays out all the elements that the Renaissance Christian European tradition uses to depict orgiastic rites of witches' Sabbath, the goat, the intercourse, and dancing and drinking blood. But the goat also represents natural, unrestful, instinctive elements. Therefore, Concha's most distinctive element, she is in fact the most goat-like of them all, imply a surely centuries-old intimacy coveted by the protagonist. Little by little, Stefano's description turns this poor maid into a diabolical enchantress. Concha's witchy character is enhanced by her house's location. Outside the town, beyond the bridge, isolated between the road and the beach. These are all quotes from Pavese's novels, of course. The association between trespassing the boundaries imposed by civilization and irrationality, folly, and nonconformity has deep roots in Italian literary tradition. For instance, in Inferno 26, Dante meets Ulysses punished for having trespassed the limits imposed by God's rationality, namely the pillars of Hercules, and labels it il folle volo, the crazy flight. And during the Renaissance, Ludovico Ariosto builds upon this topic by placing an evil witch isolated from the rest of society. In his main poem, Orlando Furioso, or The Frenzy of Orlando, Ariosto sets Alcina's residence, and I quote, beyond the pillars fixed by Hercules, had ventured over the forbidden seas, end of quote. With his tongue-in-cheek style aimed at smirking at the beliefs that so evil in the unknown, unexplored territories, Ariosto portrays Alcina as a witch who seduced, and I quote, a thousand others by whom she'd been courted, by words and charms, end of quote, and then transformed them into stones or trees. Like Ariosto did with Alcina, Stefano has turned Concha into a sensual witch who uses her charms to subdue men and whose stray sexuality causes her isolation. However, while for Alcina, isolation is the necessary condition to carry on her evil seductions, Concha's outcast position stems first from being the victim of a rape and having conceived a child from it, and secondly, from being ostracized because of it. Stefano highlights that she is, and I quote, the lover of a filthy old man who left her pregnant and have become, and I quote again, young kids prurians, end of quote. As we have seen, while Levi sympathizes with his witch, Julia, thus showing an awareness towards arbitrary gender role norms, Pavese seems to display an ambivalent attitude towards them. On one hand, he adheres to the perspective stating that drifting off the narrow, rigid path which the regime traces over Catholic petit bourgeois morality means not only facing dire consequences, such as isolation or confinement, but also siding with evil. On the other hand, he shows an unappeasable desire for this wild female diabolical figure, thus wanting to take advantage of his position of power. Finally, we get to 
uh, talk about Elena. During fascism, women could only define their place in society in relation to men, as wives, daughters, or sisters. In addition to that, in his novel, Pavese objectifies and animalizes women, thus justifying their being used and consumed by men. I already showed you how Stefano animalizes Concha to justify his sexual desire for her. However, his objectification of women and his acceptance of patriarchal metaphors of domination rise during an early morning hunting scene with Giannino, one of Stefano's temporary friends in Brancaleone Calabro. During the hunt, the two partners talk about women in town. The whole conversation proceeds obliquely through metaphors and analogies, but quickly focuses on concha. At some point, they kill a quail, and Giannino, tongue-in-cheek, asks Stefano if he is aware of what quail means in Brancaleone Calabro, and if he participates in that hunt as well. In Italia, qualian, uh, quail, and its diminutive form, quaglietta, can be used to refer to a young, attractive woman. He then goes on to offer in the quail they just shot and invites Stefano to bring it to the young woman he likes, Concha, so that she can cook it for him. And I quote, so she can say she served you her quail, end of quote. However, Janina warns this one needs some pepper because, and I quote, it tastes gamey. After being reassured by Giannino that that would not cause any jealousy on his part, suddenly Stefano felt happy. Uh, Stefano felt happy. He felt free from Elena's body and understood he could behave as he pleased and could keep her or reject her with a simple gesture. The easy thought that every woman carries a quail filled him with laughter. While Stefano longs for concha and hopes to consume her as a delicious meal, he carries on using Elena, his maid and lover. Pavese's protagonist objectifies Elena in the most demeaning manner. Stefano would have liked if she had come in the morning and gotten into his bed as a wife, but went away like a dream, which doesn't ask for either words or promises, to be a body without asking anything. He rejects any sentimental attachment to Elena, threatens her to reveal their affair to force her to visit him at his will, and tries to leave her without any power or agency. When she comes in the morning, bringing goat milk for his breakfast, as she is in the kitchen warming the milk up and complaining about the ex-husband, Stefano enjoys the sweet goat smell coming from the stove, which made Elena bearable because it made her a woman ordinary but good, an unlovable and resigned presence like a hen, a broom, or a maid, quote, unquote. Resentful divorcee, resigned lover, Elena finds her place within domesticity, above all in the kitchen, where she can play one of her, one of her best cards, cooking, the other being sex. There, the goat meal potion she concocts, however, brings an unexpected effect. While the goat features excite Stefano's desire when associated with concha, goat smell make Elena just bearable, an inferior being, an hybrid within an object and an animal. These metaphors help Stefano disassociate himself emotionally from Elena by classifying her as something that has been objectified. Moreover, Pavese's protagonist justifies his behavior by labeling himself, and I quote, un tipo selvatico, end of quote, an expression that can be rendered in English in several ways, including a churlish dude, an untamable guy, and a gamey lad. While the first two translations may emphasize his attempt to justify his crudely insensitive behavior towards Elena, the third one points towards his titillating attraction to the morally tainted concha. In Stefano's self-assigned label lays his conflicting relationship with, with the reality, Stefano's obsession with wilderness highlights his inconsistent relationship with patriarchy. On one hand, he amplifies wild elements in the pan where Elena cooks some milk for him and the amphora where Concha carries waters. These food containers, according to the anthropologist Levi-Strauss, signify one key move towards civilization of humankind. 
um, Stefano's attempt at making them wild seems to subtract them from the realm of civilization. However, his decidedly patriarchal behavior towards these two women signifies his in-depth rootedness in the civilization he's supposed to oppose. Although Stefano never eats conscious quail, he gets to eat meat once. Elena serves it to him. The day before he is granted amnesty, Stefano, coming back home one night, he found a bunch of wild flowers, and I quote, in a glass on the table and next to them a dish with roasted meat. At first, Stefano is blown away from Elena's act and sus suspects she did it as payback. However, he almost immediately brushes off that thought, and I quote, laughed and ate with excitement, end quote. However, he would never see Elena again. During his last night in town, he waits for her in vain. And the next day, instead of Elena bringing him fresh goat milk, a young child with an amphora asks him if he wants any water. Stefano's relationship with Concha exemplifies all his relationship with women through the, throughout the novel. Women seldom speak in the novel, but rather they are represented by men's speech and they only appear when they relate to men to provide food or other services. Uh, the relationship between El Stefano and Elena specifically exemplifies what sociologists, food sociologist Carol J. Adams called the cycle of objectification, fragmentation, and consumption in Stefano's relationship with, we with women. In her work, The Sexual Politics of Meat, and I quote, Adam connects butchering and sexual violence in our culture. Objectification allows oppressors to view other beings as object and treat them as such. When objectified, other beings are without agency. Moreover, looking at other beings as objects allows to dismember, fragment, and consume them. Consumption completes the cycle by overpowering, dismembering, and effacing the identity of the other. Its cycle begins with language, especially with metaphors, which fragments objects and separates them from their ontological meaning. After being consumed, objects exist only through the representation, using that the referent reenacts their annihilation. End of quote. By cooking Stefano a steak, Elena partake in this cycle. Moreover, as the steak becomes the symbol of her body, she allows him to consume her one last time through her referent. Therefore, she transubstantiates her body, thus conjuring up the key miracle celebrated by the Roman Catholic tradition to free herself from her patriarchal subjugation. Just like Julia and Donna Caterina, another character from Levi's uh, novel, who used food to either concoct love potions or to enthrall other people, Elena vamps up a strategically meaningful symbols to free herself from Stefano's sexual spell. In this overturn of events, Rehofer signifies also a subtraction. By making the stake a symbol of her flesh offered to him for the last time, she fragments her identity as a woman, an object of desire, and a maid for Stefano. She detaches herself from the symbol of her flesh and subtracts herself from Stefano's control. By having Stefano reenacting for the last time the annihilation of the object of his desire, she allows herself to exist only through her representation. In conclusion, as we have seen, traditionally Western civilizations have cast witches out. However, both Levi and Pavese problematize this placement. On one hand, both authors place witches at the border of civilization, in a geographical sense, in a, in, in a symbolic sense. Witches live in houses that are always at the outskirts of towns, to signal their not belonging to the civilized, law-abiding, morally clean portion of society. Moreover, in Levi, they also belong to a pre-Christian, thus pre-civilization, pre-historic reality, as the title of the novel itself suggests. Nevertheless, in both novels, witches and women in general occupy kitchens, key places both inside homes and these stories, since much of the action happens in kitchens. The kitchen is the space fascism not only assigned to women as those in charge of all the needs within the family, as mothers, wives, or sisters, but also the space it invaded by imposing its values and norms. 
In this perspective, the confinement of women mirrors that of both authors. However, Pavese doesn't seem to be aware of the patriarchal system's justifications for the economic, social, and legal subordination of women to men. On the contrary, while Levi's protagonist never rejects his male bourgeois anti-fascist intellectual identity, he turns over the regime's subjugating tropes, resists its categorization by accepting now unconventional forms of knowledge, and ultimately gives voice to those who would be otherwise silenced. In conclusion, looking at the relationship between women and food in these works shows how Levy writes from a place of radical opposition to the ideological tenets, not only of the fascist regime, but also of the modern state, while Pavese still seems deeply rooted in it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Norman. Thank you. Um, as before, um, if anyone has any questions, please do um, put that put them into the chat or um, raise your hand um, using the reactions button. Um, so please, please do make use of either either option. Um, while we wait for those to sort of come in, Norman, I'm just I, one thing I really sort of noticed was there's a there's kind of a focus in both both novels of sort of um, the physicality, but also of the senses in particular. Um, I just wondered if you could say a bit more about this kind of sort of the role of senses. So sort of, there was taste was definitely strong there, but was there smell as well? I don't remember seeing or he hearing quite so much on smell or, and that kind of side of it. Is it. Was there that kind of thing as well? It just um, seemed quite this... important in some ways that, that there would be this kind of mix of the different senses that they were describing, making those descriptions. Yes. Um, in terms of the, the use of five senses, I can... Um... I can definitely say that Levy, for instance, is uh, definitely visual. Uh, I, I think it, it could be linked to the fact that Levy was also a painter himself, uh, but ev each and every scene uh, he presents in, the, in, in his novel uh, is, is highly visual. No? There are scenes in which the foods are described uh, with their color, with their textures, uh, with their appearance, their presentation, etc. And eventually there is also a little bit about taste. Uh, Pavese, on the other hand, uh, he, he talks about the smell quite, uh, quite a bit. Everything is defined either uh, with the smell or sound. Uh, these two senses appear uh, a lot uh, throughout the novel. Uh, he's also visual, of course. Uh, he describes uh, the sunlight, uh, uh, he describes the fact that women never appear outside their houses, are uh, always appear in the shadow, uh, behind uh, doors, behind curtains, you know? but smells uh, are what um, hits uh, the author's mind. Uh, most of the time, you know, especially goat smell, uh, wild smells of flower, of animals, of foods. Now, even when he goes to the local um, osteria, which is uh, kind of a uh, little restaurant, you know, uh, he describes most of the foods he is being served with is uh, with the smell first. Yes. Mm -hmm. And goat seems to be very popular in terms as a description there as well, which I, I presume is partly this kind of sort of the um, kind of sort of which elements is is the reason for that partly is it or is it actually because of other associations with goats? Do, do you mean the, the relationship between goats and, and witchcraft? In yeah, I, I presume that's the reason why goat was used rather than any other animals to, as a description or um that's a that's an interesting that's an interesting question i i i believe that pavese uses the goat well first because the goat probably was the, an element of the landscape mm -hmm. it was probably the uh you know goat cheese is in fact very popular especially in the southern regions of italy um so it, it probably was part of their daily life but um, as I said, it constitutes a highly symbolical element for Pavese. No? And um, 
I don't think he did it by, by chance. No? So he, he sees the opportunity to connect the wilderness, the wild element with the diabolical element no? to, uh, to, exert, to, to show his power. Uh, to his male power over over women's bodies and uh, identities. Thanks, yeah. Uh, Kelly, did you say that you had a few comments that you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Matt. Um, thank you, Norman. That was really fascinating. I'm going to have to read those books. I have not read them before. Um, I, I, I guess some mine is not so much questions, but I have some interesting comments that kind of um, that I saw between the two presentations, actually. So it was interesting, I mean, the idea of the modern state and this patriarchal framework and how are we sort of thinking about that? And sort of both of them sort of show food and sort of the, the inequality between men and women. So you've got sort of meat and men going on here. Um, and, you know, and I was, I guess I wondering also about Norman's about the idea of reward and meat and men. Um, but then, you know, you also see the centrality of women's domesticity in both of them. And it's interesting because you, 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 two of you are working on different time periods in Italy, but you see this reoccurrence of these ideas going on. Um, and then, you know, the responsibility placed on women and the blame placed on women. So I don't know if you want to speak to anything of that, but I just found that fascinating that, that both, that a lot of these different themes are running through both of yours. Um, you know, one is in literature and one is sort of the lived experience. So. Um, yeah, that, that's all I had to say about that. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, this is um, what, what what I see. Well, of course, uh, if we go back to patriarchy and the rise of the modern state and the rise of capitalism, uh, we are we are moving inside uh, the framework of the Marxist critique uh, of, of culture and, and the state, of course. No? And uh, in this perspective, there is uh, a rise in power from a system that is uh, mainly patriarchal, you know, uh, that places you know, you know, the white male bourgeois uh, person in charge and everything else and everybody else is outside this cycle of power, of course. Uh, we can see that, for instance, during fascism, uh, there were several policies which not only confined men to these essential roles that, uh, of just being sidekicks for men, uh, but they were guiding also the consumption of foods uh, for all the population. Uh, there are studies that demonstrate how the fascist regime um, manipulated uh, scientific knowledge to make it appear as people needed less calories per day uh, in order to make them consume less food because the, the, the fascist autarchy couldn't actually provide enough food for everybody. You know? And they had to provide also for the, uh, for, for the enhance, for, for the military, uh, you know? for the army, because they were trying to enforce this, uh, first of all, their colonial policies, and then of course, the effort of the World War II. You know? uh, so they tried to convince the population to consume less food in order to make them uh, healthier, you know, where, whereas in fact they were trying to hide the fact that they didn't have enough resources. And of course they placed the women in charge of this new, uh, new rule, uh, so to speak, even though women uh, didn't represent uh, a strong part of, of, you know, of the population in, in the fascist perspective. So I think that Levy in, in, this, in his book is very aware of this um, uh, paradox because on the one hand, fascism places women in a key role because they are in charge of the family's you know, nutrition. But on the other hand, uh, they don't have a lot of value inside uh, Italian, the Italian society. You know? uh, so this, this is the connections I see between, between patriarchy and food consumption and, and the role of women, of course, during fascism. Um, 
Sylvia, do you have any kind of comments that you'd like to add to that from your sort of perspective? Yeah, I was just thinking about, uh, thank you, Norman, was really, really interesting. I, I love the, uh, I, I love Levis, I love the Cristo, Si Fermato Eboli, well, it's one of my favorite books. And I was actually uh, thinking about the fact that women in, in our work, basically, we can see women resisting to a certain narrative. But in, in my case, these, these women are like um, using modernity. I mean, they, they are, their aim is they want modernity. They want modernity against a state, against po politicians who are asking them to go back to the past. And in, I think in your case, uh, uh, instead, these women are in sort of rejecting uh, mo this modernity, the, the fascist modernity, capitalistic modernity. So it's it's interested. It's interested. I interesting how uh, also the concept of modernity uh, changes and uh, of rationality. Of uh, I think it, it it's interesting to it's interesting to see to see this to see also how. Um, um, yes, uh, I was thinking about that. That really uh, hit me. And also, uh, your presentation just made, made me think about Silvia Federici's work, uh, you know, uh, Caliban and the Witch and um, mm -hmm. Witch Hunting, War Against Women. I mean, it's, uh, it's all there. It's, uh, it's really interesting how... <laughs> And then I, I, I think I, I never read the Caliban and the Witch, but I read the other book. And I think that could be really interesting to put the food perspective in her, also in her work. I, I would, I'm, I'm curious about. The... Yes. Well, thank you for mentioning it. In fact, I'm, I have read um, uh, almost everything <laughs> written by Federici. I love uh, this author. She's, she's um, very prolific and very uh, insightful when it comes to the world of witchcraft and how it works symbolically, but also politically uh, in, in the realm of, you know, patriarchy and capitalism. And it's really interesting to see how she develops this theme throughout all her uh, scholarship. And uh, yes, thank you. Um, it's... Um, it's an interesting point of view, the one you raise about modernity, you know, because we can see that there are actually two, two different ways of dealing with modernity. One uh, that completely embraces it and tries to use it to actually resist to it. And the other one, you know, completely rejecting it and going back to, uh, to a past that's not even here anymore, no? And uh, that almost looks like a mythical past, no? And um, so I wonder if that has to do with the fact that uh, we are looking at uh, one author, especially Levy, who is uh, not only deeply immersed in a, in a what I would call um, an anti-modern, anti-state uh, line of thought, uh, almost anarchic in a way, and um, and on the other hand, you are dealing with a research that comes or stems from the observation of uh, uh, media that are actually part of that system of production. No, so we we are, I don't know if that might be the case. Uh, it could be, uh, you know. Uh, one idea. Uh, one thing that keeps coming to my head is because I saw in the chat that somebody brought up um, cookbooks. And in fact, there are many cookbooks that try to sway women uh, towards using the products of modernity to manage family resources for a, for a better, more efficient uh, um, you know, uh, let's say family planning, you know? And I saw that in Russian cookbooks, in Italian American cookbooks, and in Italian cookbooks from the fascist era, they all point towards uh, 
a better planning, a better use of resources, uh, especially with using food stuff that is uh, definitely industrialized. You know? So. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we're pretty much at, at the end of our time. Is there any other questions at all that anyone would like to raise? Um, Sylvia, you've just put a link in, so thanks for that. Okay, if it, there's... It's oh, the sorry. article about autarky and austerity we were talking about earlier. Ah, brilliant. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you for that. So that's, so that's there shared with everyone if they would like to have a look. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Norman and Sylvia. Um, thank you again, and just sort of raise a, an applause. And um, thank you to both of you. Thank you. Um, it was really great to have you both here. Um, our next session, just before we all go, is on the 27th of January um, at the same time. And it is um, Louise Morgan and Marzina Keating. Um, and they'll be talking about, well, on the topic of alternative food ways. Um, so Louise will be talking about the way we used to eat historical narratives in 21st century British clean eating. And Marzina will be talking about what's on the menu in village and convalescent cookery in uh, 20th century Ireland. So please do join us for that on the 27th, um, just book in the normal way that you would do. Um, so thank you again to both of our speakers and we'll hopefully you. see you all um, next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Have a nice evening. Yes, have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you.